This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We're reading 1 Samuel chapter 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty man are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren had borne seven, and she that had many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth. Listen to this. When you guys are thinking about the love and mercy of the Lord, remember there are two sides to our God. He's multifaceted, and we better get acquainted with every facet. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor. Oh, yes, he does, y'all. That's me talking now. Oh, yes, he does. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. Mm. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. Does, not, does that not tell you God's in control? Let's keep going. Verse 8. He raises up the poor out of the dust. Thank you, Lord. And lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. And he has set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints. Y'all are safe. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness. He knows how to shut your mouth. For by strength shall no man prevail. Nobody is all that and a bag of chips like they may want to think they are. Verse 10, last verse. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he number upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. So there's the good news for us. We know that God's going to keep our feet. He'll keep us from falling. He'll keep us safe. He gives us divine protection. As Lynn read in Psalms 23, he is preparing us. He is, he is protecting us. He is keeping us. He is providing for us. We don't have to worry. Yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, baby cakes, you are safe. Mm-hmm. Listen. That is for those who remain under the secret place of the Almighty. That secret place is holy. That secret place is divine. And we must reverence that place we have in him. We must reverence, fear it, respect it. Or we must reverence and live accordingly. See, when you live in a teepee, you live a different lifestyle than you do when you live in an igloo. When you live in an igloo, you live a whole different way than you do in a mansion. So the bottom line is you have to decide what life are you going to live? And God, I believe in these last days, God is challenging his saints because as the scripture says, to whom much is given, much is required. Now, it's going to sound like I'm fussing at you. I'm not trying to sound that way. All I'm trying to do is deliver, you know, deliver your mail. So I don't have an attitude. I want to I, I want to preface what I'm saying with that because I can get emphatic and I can sound like a scolding mother. And I'm not trying to sound like that. It's just my personality. 
the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. I'm not saying I'm a prophet. I'm just saying spirit. Yeah, the gift is subject to the prophet. I mean, the yeah. So that's me. Someone else like Peter may deliver the same message and be low-keyed, mellow as a cello and chilling. Yeah. So just understand this is personality here. All right. So bear with me on that. <sighs> Knowing what it feels like to fail God scares me for those who don't know what it feels like to feel his anger. That scares me. Because once you feel the anger of God, you do get scared. It will scare the boo-boo out of you. Trust me. I've been there. I felt it. Beg God for mercy. Thank God he heard that prayer. And I hurried up and lined up. All right. Sometimes when we go through changes in our lives, we have to decide. Which lifestyle are we going to live? And when we decide we must stick with it, I tell you why. When you are torn between two opinions, what happens when you're torn? Thank you, Lord. What happens when you're torn between two opinions? Here's one envelope representing you. This is your decision. You're torn. Between two opinions, something's going to come up lacking. Is this the side that's God's or is this? Is this the side that belongs to your flesh or is this? You see what I'm saying? Now, you'll see this in the video for those of you who are just on the phone and can't see right now. I tore an envelope and when I tore it, I just tore it inadvertently. I mean, I did it without trying to. To make a plan, I just ripped it, and one part came up real small, and the other side was big. Sometimes our lives are like that. We're looking for God's blessings. We're looking for God to rescue us. When the nitty-gritty hits the fan and the wolves are out chomping the bit on our hiney, and we're running like you-know-what, like a bat out of you-know-where, trying to get right up under God's armpits. And what God is saying to many of us is, if you had stayed under my armpits in the secret place in the first place, this wouldn't have gone, this wouldn't have happened. So thank God for his mercy. Like I said last week, it's kind of a segue into it. Like I said last week, thank God many of us did not get AIDS. Thank God many of us did not get killed. Thank God many of us are not doing 25 years to life in a main prison, being turned out by women or by men, or beaten to death by guards. Thank God we're not living on the street in a cardboard box, begging, prostituting, selling and buying just to make do, getting drunk just to be warm. Thank God it ain't that bad. But I'm going to read a story to you. I want to read what. I want to read verse 9 and verse 10 again. I just want you to hear this. He will keep the feet of his saints. And the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. We can't prevail through if we're a great liar. We can't prevail if we're a good conniver. We can't prevail no matter what we're doing to get by, to get over the hump. No matter what our little schemes and tricks are, we can't gamble ourselves out of it. We can't screw ourselves out of it. That's right. Some of y'all are trying to get out by someone else's heart. You figure somebody loves me, they'll come and rescue me. Oh, take me in your arms, rescue me. I want your tender charms, cause I, come on now. No, that's not what God wants you looking when he wants you to look. He wants you to look and seek his face. 
He wants you to focus on him. Right now, it's not time for you to look for Miss Honey or Mr. Bunny. It's time for you to get your act together. And the only way you're going to get your act together is when you ask God to take all your broken pieces and put you back together again. When God puts you back together, then you'll have your act together. But until then, leave all that other mess alone. I don't care how hot and bothered you get. Leave it alone. It ain't time. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter, we already did that, 2 Chronicles chapter 25. This is a story about a king who started out right and ended up wrong. Amaziah, this is 2 Chronicles chapter 25, starting at verse 1. Amaziah was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Johadan of Jerusalem, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. Uh-oh. Oops. Mm. Now, it came to pass when the kingdom was established to him that he slew his servants that had killed the king, the king, his father. But he slew not their children, but did as it is written in the law. So he started out right. In the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded, saying, The fathers shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, but every man shall die for his own sin. Moreover, Amaziah gathered Judah together and made them captains over thousands. In other words, he, he established his army. And he hired them and paid them a hundred thousand, verse four, uh, six. He paid them a hundred thousand. He paid a hundred thousand mighty men of valor, a hundred talents of silver. Verse seven. But they kept, there came a man of God to him saying, O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel to wit, with all the children of Ephraim. But if thou go, do it. In other words, if you're going to do what you're going to do, go on, do what you're going to do. Go on, don't come crying now. Go on, do it. But if thou wilt, go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God hath power. Check this out, y'all. Right back to that groove. For God hath power to help. And what does the rest of it say? And to cast down your choices, your decisions, those you run to, those you seek for comfort, places you go, things you do, choices you make will decide whether God will help you or cast you down on your backside. Right in the middle, right in the thick of it. Right in the middle of your tears, of your desperation. You got to be careful, babies. God is not playing. Okay. I got, I got to talk right now. Let, let's have this little campfire talk. See, God knows that some of you right now, God knows that some of you sit up in our online church. Some of you go sit up in the building. Some of you go to prayer meetings. Some of you go to Bible studies. Uh, and what are you there for? Some of you are there for God. Some of you are there seeking, scratching, digging, crying out. And some of you want to belong. Oh, I hate to tell you this, because some of you, it may not have occurred to you, but it occurred to God. He led me to that scripture too. Some of them come, they sit, they listen as if you're playing an instrument, like they might listen to me. 
as if I'm a world-renowned flute player, f- flautist, or a pianist, or, or a, a saxophonist. Or coming to see a wonderful place so I could entertain them. They come with itching ears, but not with a hungry heart. See, that's the scary part is the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You think you know what's in your heart. You think you know what's in your motive. Trust me, I dealt with God on me before I dealt with you because I wanted to make sure there was nothing that I was being hypocritical about. Lord, show me. Because there are things you show me in the past I didn't even know was there till you said it. What I'm trying to share with you is there are things in your heart you don't even know is there. Some of you, I remember... Uh, somebody mm -hmm, and I, they'll know who they are. I don't know if they want their name called on this one, but somebody and I were talking a while back and they realized that sometimes it's just a matter of, I like to fight. I like to argue. Like my niece, Erica, I can call her name. She's cool. She's an attorney. She's right in her calling. Because girlfriend loves to debate. She's always got another angle so that she has another way to debate your side. Even if she agrees with you, she'll come up with an argument for the sake of argument. It's just in her blood. And some of you like to fight. Some of you like to kick. Some of you like to punch. Some of you like to do whatever it is you like to do. You to, come on, let's get it on, baby. I got something for you. Come on. You remember that one? Yeah, come on. Come on. Come on. So what happens is that lights your fire because you got fight in you. What God is trying to do is teach you how to fight the enemy and teach you how to fight you. But what you'd rather do is fight everybody else. And when somebody comes to you with, thus saith the Lord, you cop a fat attitude like what's his face did. Amaziah. Yeah, when the the uh the man of God came and told him what was up and what wasn't, he got an attitude. And he decided, hey, I'm the king. I don't know who you are, but I'm the king. I do what I big and bad want to do. And guess what? The end of the story, read that chapter. The end of the story, brother man got his butt killed. Straight out. See, there are consequences. There are consequences that some of you will pay. You may go straight to heaven, but you could have come easy or you can come hard. Some people are hard nuts to crack. When they see it their way, even when they know they're off the beaten path, they don't want to hear it. Don't tell me. Don't, don't come talking to me with that stuff. I know the Bible better than you do. I know what I'm doing. I got this. You got it and you're going to get it too. Oh, you're going to get it. Because when you get that epiphany from God, mm -mm, all that hardness is going to melt away real quick. There's a street expression that quotes the Bible. It doesn't quote it. It paraphrases it. And I'm going to say it the Bible way. Then I'm going to say it the street way. So you really get the point. The Bible says, Pride cometh before a fall, and a haughty heart before destruction. The street says, mm -hmm, a hard head makes a soft behind. That's what the street says. But the Bible takes it further to the level of destruction. Lord. The Lord gave me a dream. I'm, I got two stories hitting my head at the same time. Lord, which one? Okay, we'll talk about the boys. Thank you. There was a father. Now, let's consider this the last days, and let's consider the two boys, two servants of the Most High King, and the Father, God. 
So let's paint that scenario. This is like an allegory, so to speak. This is a true story. It was in the news. Two boys and a little sister. The older brother, the middle brother, baby sister, about four or five years old. Big brother, 13, 14 years old. He gets his little brother and his baby sister and he whizzies in their ear. And baby sister's putting a check on him and he's shutting her up. This is what he whizzied in their ear. When Pops was leaving the house, Pops explicitly instructed every child, stay in the house, and if you go anywhere, don't go beyond the gate. Stay in the yard. Do not go near the gate. Stay in the yard. If the ball goes over the fence, leave it. Stay in the gate. <clears throat> he lived in the country. So they lived about a half a mile from the riverbed. There was a lot of water in that riverbed, and that's where they all swam. Soon as Pop turned the corner, Big Brother whizzies in their ear and coerces them, because everybody, when they get into mischief, do you notice drinkers want people to drink with them? Smokers want people to smoke with them. Isn't that crazy? Uh, uh, <clears throat> let me see, how can I say this in a more delicate manner. Uh, lovers, there you go, love, want people to make love with. Uh, anyway, now, this is what I say to all y'all that are bent on mischief. Go do it by yourself. You big and bad enough to do it. Why do you need company? Hmm? What is it that makes you want company to go do your dastardly deed with you? You want to go rip somebody off? Go rip them off. Why do you have to pull your friends and threaten them to get in it with you? Isn't that crazy? Think about that one. Now, I'm going to leave that. Now, let's move on to the boys. So, Big Brother wants to go swimming. It's hot. They're great swimmers. The two boys are great swimmers. So, he gets his trunks, his, his baby brother's trunks. And he coerces them to go to the riverbed. And little baby sis is saying, but, but Papa said, and he, you shut up. If you, if you tell, I'll never talk to you again. You better not tell. You know how kids have this little bully way about them. So they, baby sis got to be with them. So she follows them. And she stands on the edge with them. Big brother jumps in. He says, you stand here and watch baby sis. He jumps in. He has no idea how strong the current is. Now, the father loves, check this out, the father loves his two sons as much as he loves baby girl. Baby girl is the only one being obedient. Big brother jumps in. The current uh, get, gets the best of him. And before you know it, he's being swept away. And a middle brother knows that he is in trouble. And he's a great swimmer, so he dives in. Uh-oh. Baby sis can't see anybody. So she comes running home. And Papa's just coming home. Where are the boys? And, and, and she's not saying she's acting weird. And he's putting up the groceries and he says, where's so-and-so, so-and-so, so -and -so, where are you? And she's getting more and more fidgety. He knows something's up. So he sits her down. He says, you got to tell me, where are they? And she, <laughs> and she points and he hops in the truck and puts her in the seat and runs off and, and drives down as close to the riverbed as he can get with, you know, without falling off the edge. And he parks the truck and runs forward. And he's looking and looking and looking and he can't see his boys. And he's hollering for their name. He's in desperate search. And his heart is breaking with every step. And that, that, that feeling, that, that ominous feeling is coming over him. Oh, no. And he finds one of his sons laying there dead. The oldest one. And he looks further and he finally runs into his second son. Both were fatal encounters. 
He wasn't angry at his sons. He was broken. He was hurt. It wasn't father's judgment. He didn't come over there and drown the two boys for disobeying his orders. He cried for them. The, the damage was done. This is the problem with us in life. We're young. The younger we are, the smarter we think we are. We think we're strong. We think we got it going on. We think we're a hundred bags of chips. We think we're all that. Baby, you ain't been around the block but two times and you think you're grown. I don't care if you're 35 or 45. There are things in this life you know nothing about. There are consequences you haven't heard of or tasted of. And you dare to disobey God in order to satisfy your flesh. We're living in the last days where demons are busting loose. They're, they're cutting up like, like crazy folk. They're, they're bouncing off the chandeliers. They're all in your houses, all around your stuff, meddling with your kids, meddling with you, screwing with your minds. Oh, my goodness. And you're playing on their turf. You're playing with the demons and their toys. Why? Because you got an urge. Why? Because you got needs. Why? Because you're afraid. Why? Because you're alone. Stop it. Some things come on you not because God's mad at you and it's his judgment. Some things come on you because light and decisions and choices have consequences. And no matter how severe the consequence, you cannot afford to get angry with God because he's not the one that told you to go do what you did that got you in the mess you're in. Remember that. But there are times when some of you are not just acting out of need. Some of you are not just acting out of circumstance out of the desires of your flesh but some of you are acting out of stone cold will you're stubborn you're stiff necked and you better not say a word Shut that. I don't want to hear it you ain't my mama remember that you ain't my mama so the godly counsel that would come to you, you shut down like Amaziah did. You shut it down. You shut it up. And then you go do what you want to do. Don't look at me crazy. I ain't your baby. You want some kids, you go raise your own. I'm grown, baby. I'm going to do what I want to do. And then you start making excuses. You start saying, well, this one is a nice person. They have a good heart. And God's looking at them like they're an abomination. And you shouldn't touch the unclean thing. But in your mind, because everything in your body is screaming, feed me. You got excuses, baby. You want to rationalize everything that about them that ain't godly. You don't want to hear your mama. You don't want to hear your cousin. You don't want to hear your pastor. You don't want to hear your brother, your sister say anything about, don't you think that that's unequally yoked? You don't want to hear that. You ain't going to hear it. You just about bite their head off if they say something. That's the one that's in danger. You're in the worst danger because you're the one where God will say, I have the power to help. Oh, yeah, I do. But also to cast down. And with those attitudes, that pride, that hard head, that stubborn will, that rebellion, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And I hate to say it. Some of y'all folks are out there dabbling in that while you're dabbling in the bed with the one you ain't supposed to be with. 
And you fight tooth and nail because you like to fight. You'll fight tooth and nail with anybody that dares say anything against your baby, against your honey, against your sweet thing. I'm letting that marinate for a minute so y'all can go over your life and think, yeah, where did I do that? Yeah, I did that then. Yeah, that, yeah. And a lot of y'all are forgiven because you stopped, because you woke up, smelled the coffee, and you obeyed God. You got it together. Amaziah never got it together. Mm -mm. No, he was dog determined to do it his way. I've got to be me. What else can I be but who I am? Yeah, you keep singing that song. And somebody's going to be singing a song over your box one day. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you guys are on YouTube. But some of y'all are living a double life and you know it. But God knows it. And this is not playtime. One day he's going to bust those clouds. There's not going to be many days hence. And I'd rather you get mad at me than to get mad at God and get offended in him. Jesus said, do not be offended in me. When John said, are you the one or should I look for another? Because he didn't come rescue him from getting his head chopped off. Mm-hmm. He was getting offended in Jesus. Jesus said, blessed are those who don't get offended in me. In other words, watch your step, John. You're getting too close to that line now. I know what you're saying. I hear you loud and clear. The, the messengers don't know what you're really saying to me, but I know what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Don't sit up there and get bitter at me because I'm not getting you out of this mess. No, some things have to go south. Because it's part of the big picture. It's part of the big plan. But just because you have to get your head chopped off doesn't mean I'm going to let you feel the pain. You still got to trust me. See, some of y'all, you can trust God when things are going well. But you start hitting the panic button when things are going wrong. And you feel like he ain't moving fast enough. So you better do this and you better do that. You better hook up with them. You better hook up with that. You better move here. You better go there. You better run here. You better run. And you're running around trying to put all these fires out. And you're, just, you're like a, a, a chicken with your head cut off. You don't know which way you're going. You're just going. You're going. Because you got to do something. You can't just sit still. Oh, no. If you sit still, God's going to abandon you. God's going to forget all about you. I am not forgotten. I am not, and I ain't abandoned. God knows my name. Are you convinced that he knows you? Are you convinced that he loves you? Or are you more convinced that you're in a pickle and God is impotent? How convicted are you? You must not only trust God in life, but you must trust God in death. When I watched my husband on his deathbed, all the way till he couldn't move anymore, he was always praising God. He would always raise his hands up and the tears would stream down and he wasn't saying, Baby, why has God got me dying like this? Why is he? No, he never went there. He died like a, like a champion. Even in his weakness, he was strong. Because he kept his mind stayed on God. And even when he got a little nervous and he got a little scared because I never went here before. And I started sharing with him the testimonies of blind people that went to heaven and they could see trees for the first time. And they had a knowing. They knew what they were looking at. They knew what a bird was, what, what a human was, what a dog was. They knew what water was. They knew what they were looking at when they looked at it, even though they never saw it before. They knew what the color was when they saw the color. 
And by the time I got through with him, he was like, baby, let's pray that God takes us together. Come on, get to bed with me. Let's pray. And he got excited about going to be with the Lord. He never lost his faith till he took his last breath. Just because things go south doesn't mean that's the end of your story. Remember that. Was it the end when Jesus died on the cross and God didn't come to his rescue? I ain't looking at nobody. I'm looking up at the clouds. So don't y'all feel guilty. I'm just letting y'all think about that. Did he fail when John got beheaded? Jesus right there in town. Did Lazarus lose when he died and Jesus took four days to get to him? Whew! Was Jesus in a hurry? No. Was Lazarus his friend? Yes. Did Jesus forget about him? No. There was an appointed time. It's called a divine appointment. Some things must happen before some blessings can come. But as long as you are torn between two opinions, even those of you make it into heaven with a lot of your blunders, you will look back. And you will see, because God will show you all the blessings, all the deliverances, all the answers to your solution that you never got to see in real life because you didn't give God the time or the trust to get the job done. You put out your own fires. Got to put this out. Got to put that out. Got to put that out. Got to do my thing. It's my thing. I do what I want to do. You can't tell me who to sock it to. You know, last night when I was thinking about this message, the Lord laid like a dialogue in my mind. I could actually see a skit. Yeah, you know me, I'm a drama queen, so I see scenarios. And I'm looking at these two women. One woman is trying to caution another woman. And I'm going to tell you the second dream in a minute. Trying to caution another woman about not hanging with this one, that one, or the other one. And they're mad at the woman, the woman of God. They're mad at her. Why are they mad? See, I'm 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 gonna play it out right now. See, I'm the one that's mad now, right? Yeah, yeah. Here's a little skit. Well, see, you know, you get to go home. You got a husband to lay up in the bed with. You ain't laying by yourself like I am. The winter is cold. I'm all by myself. I don't have nobody to put their arms around me. And you're going to sit up there and look at me like something wrong with me because I want a man in my life. Girl, you better get up out of my face. Uh-uh. See, you go on home and you snuggle up with your man here. Yeah. And then you go look at me and you just going to say a little prayer for me while I'm single and I'm out here all by myself. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get me a man. See, you can't tell me nothing because ain't nobody around to lay in bed with me. And you don't care that I'm going to be alone because you got yours. Now I'm going to go get mine. i catch you later. Catch you on the rebound. That's the attitude. That's that dangerous attitude. That's the panic that we run into. And we run into rash decisions, hasty moves, putting out those fires, baby. Uh, the other dream I had <clears throat> years ago, my friend Edith, the one that joined us last uh, Saturday here in the kitchen with Peter for our service. Edith, in this dream, she and I met each other at this couple's house. We were on assignment to give them marriage counseling. So we had prayed. Everything was ready. We're heading in. We meet. We, we wait, wait for each other so we can walk in together. We go up the stoop. We ring the doorbell. The husband comes to the door. So we're waiting for him to introduce us to his wife. When he takes us into the living room, his wife, is sitting there yakking on the phone. She don't want to be bothered. She waves her hand, waves us on, and she's on the phone. 
So we go into the other room, the den, I think it was. We're sitting with him and we're talking. And we're we're asking him questions and we're getting ready to do prayer. And, you know, what would you like the Lord to do and blah, blah, blah. Next thing you know, after we get through talking about whatever we talk about, the brother says, you know, Edith said, well, I guess it's time to go. So I reach for my purse and the guy says, uh, do you have a minute? I just want to ask you a few questions. And uh, he said, did you come together? And I said, no. I said, we're in a, uh, separate cars. So he, he said, thank you, Sister Edith, for coming. I just want to ask her a few questions. So Edith said, okay. And you know how soft and sweet her voice is, but there was a trepidation in there. Yeah. So she goes out to her car and she's sitting there, but she ain't moving. She's sitting. And I'm sitting there and the guy, he starts to ask me a few questions and then, beep. now I know in the dream, I know the brother's checking me out. And I know that he looks good to me too. But I'm well aware the man is married and I'm not there to do a flirtation run. This was ministry. So now I have to decide flesh or spirit. Book out of there now. So when she blows the horn, I grab my purse, said, got to run. And I knew what the horn was about. It was like God saying, don't forget what you're here for, girlfriend. Time to go. So I head down the stairs. He's trying to say, can I get you? No, whatever he was trying to say. And I'm, I, I go across the street. Edith's got a window down. She said, uh, are you going to stay or, 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 or would you like me to wait for you to get in your car and we can leave together? And she given me that look. And I said, okay, I'll go get in my car. I'll be right behind you. So she said, I'll wait and hear you start up your car. And I said, okay. I started up my car, put my seatbelt on. I remember all the detail, put it in gear. And when she took off, I was right on her tail because I knew. I knew that was God saying, get up and get out of here now before you start slipping into your flesh. See, I ain't dead now. I ain't blind either. And the brother look good. Bad English, but you get me. So what I'm trying to share with you is there are times when God puts people in your life and they're not there to be a killjoy. They're not there to, to, to crap your style. They're not there to block, see block. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, C-block is another word I don't want to say online in a spiritual loss. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I know Lynette knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> I know Pat does too. So when you want <clears throat> to follow God, even when your flesh starts to get a little tingly sensation, you get a little enticement going on, your little ego's being stroked. Time to get up, get out of Dodge, baby. A good run is always better and safer than a bad stand. You stay too long, you study long. They used to say this in the pool hall. You study long, you study wrong. And some of y'all studying the thing that's tempting you too long, baby. Next thing you know, you're not only going to study wrong, you're going to go in the wrong direction, right along with it, arm in arm, in total agreement with the sin that's pulling at your flesh and pulling on your hormones. And while you're sitting out there playing, who knows when Jesus is going to split the clouds. You could be right in the middle of a climax. Oh, that was wonderful. Oh, no. Too late. That's why you can't play. You have no idea when he's coming. And you cannot afford to play with the devil's toys. You can't afford to play in his playroom. You can't afford to tinker with stuff you know you need to keep your hands off of. Listen, this is the this is what um mm, mm, mm. Where's that scripture, Lord? 
there's a scripture that says, it just popped in my head, so I'm trying to remember where it is. If I can't find it, I'll paraphrase it. But there's a scripture where he says, uh, oh, Amaziah, yeah. He's, the guy says, uh, I already read it to you, where he said, don't send the soldiers out. Just send them home. And he says, but I paid him a hundred pieces each. He says, what should I do about that? He said, don't worry about the hundred. He said, God can do so much more. He can give you so much more. It's not a loss. It's worth obeying God. Some of you don't want to lose out on some things. And you're all about, well, what about me? What about my knees? Well, what about this? Well, what's going to happen if that happens? What's going to happen if that happens? Well, maybe God's trying to get me to go here, but I don't want to go there because it's too soon. And things might not pan out the way I want them to pan out. I want to tell you, God can do so much better. What are you worried about? If God says go, go. If God says, don't go, baby, you better stay. You better stay. Because whatever you lose, whatever you give up by staying, you will gain so much more. When I was going to PCC, I applied for a job as an interpreter for the deaf. What happened? At the same time, the Lord let me know, I want you to go to school and take cosmetology so you can be self-employed the way you want. And I'm saying, well, I got hired. They wrote out the schedule. But God said, go to school. But I got hired. This is a sure thing. I don't know if I'm going to like school. But I got hired. And I kept thinking about who knew best. Father knows best. I gave up the higher job. And I said, I'm sorry, but God told me not to do this. He wants me to go to school 40 hours a week and get my cosmetology license so I can be self-employed. Was the lady happy? No. Was the lady mad? Yes. I had to deal with her anger. But if I had taken that job, my life would never end up where it is now. Because I would have been pleasing and appeasing people and going by my own understanding. This is a sure thing. This is a maybe. It's never a maybe when God tells you to do it. Never a maybe. I don't care if the money's in your hand. And a promissory note aside, if God says don't give the money back and tear up the paper, you better do that, baby, because whatever you sacrifice for God, God will give you double for your trouble. He ain't cheap like we are. He doesn't go back on his promises on us like we do with him. All right, I feel like I've covered all bases. First, second, third base, home run, we're done. God bless you. I hope you know that whatever happens, you better trust God rather than man. You better obey God rather than man. Amen? God bless you. <laughs>